So good afternoon and uh, thank you for the, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. It's a very interesting uh, workshop for me. Uh, let me say that my, my talk is going to be slightly orthogonal to, to the previous Giuseppe who talked about very interesting topics, but this is going to be more numerics. I hope you won't be uh, you know, uh, too scared by the numerics, but uh, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to do my best in order to present it in a uh, also more theoretical way, if you want. So, um, today I would like to, to discuss some recent applications uh, we have been doing and also other people have been doing in, uh, in this field. Um, and uh, uh, the idea is to use machine learning techniques uh, and in particular neural networks based techniques to study uh, quantum systems. So what I would like today is first of all to give you um, a short introduction or relatively short introduction to the, the basic idea that we have and we are using in machine learning. So basically I will give you like a crash course in uh, machine learning so that we can understand a little bit what are the the techniques and the simple uh, uh, mathematical tools that we are using, actually. Uh, and then I'm going to discuss how we can use these ideas in the context of quantum mechanics. So, um, even though maybe most of you don't, you don't know that, but uh, we can say that one of the involuntary fathers of machine learning is uh, David Hilbert, right? So David Hilbert is one of the guys who has done a lot of things, a uh, great mathematician. And at some point, he had a collection of problems, uh, of unsolved problems at this time, at this time. Some of those are still unsolved. And one of those was to solve, to, to somehow, uh, but you basically is the following. You have uh, uh, like a polynomial, like a seven over polynomial of this form. Actually, the, the precise form is not very important, but and you want to find the roots of this polynomial, right? So we know that if the degree of the polynomial is larger than four, it's very hard to, to write down uh, in a polynomial. I mean, you cannot write down in, uh, in algebraic form the roots of this, of this polynomial. But he was asking whether we can find uh, still some compact form to write the roots of the polynomial as a function of, if you want, of b a and b, or the coefficients that you have in this thing. So, and uh, this question was answered uh, uh, actually in a much more general way uh, by, uh, by Kolmogorov and, uh, and Arnold, so other two uh, pretty clever guys. And they realized that in general, uh, if you have a genetic function uh, of many variables, so in particular you can even think that uh, the roots of this polynomial are a function of A and B, so in this case just two variables. But in general, if you have a, variable, a function of uh, of several variables, so let's say f of x1 to up to xn, then uh, they showed and uh, uh, it has, this result has been refined uh, in, the, in, the, in the last years, I mean it has been refined in the form that I'm going to write by Sprechner in the, in the 60s or 70s. Well, basically they showed, and uh, this is the refined result, that uh, this complicated, uh, or in general complicated, any complicated uh, or but uh, bounded function in uh, uh, of n variables can be written as a linear combination, as a finite linear combination. So notice that this n is the same n that you have here, of just two uh, one-dimensional functions. So the first one that I'm going to call phi, capital phi, uh, which and this function takes uh, as a, if you want as an argument also a linear co another linear combination uh, again over a small number of variables lambda p of another one-dimensional function, small phi, of my, uh, my variables. Okay, so uh, here q is the same integer that I have here, and eta is, uh, eta is just, uh, a uh, just a number. Uh, and here the important thing is that uh, 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 what Komogorov and Arnold managed to show is that in order to write an arbitrary uh, but again, bounded function uh, in of, uh, of n variables, it's enough to have uh, two one-dimensional functions. So two, two functions, univariate functions, if you want. Uh, phi, capital phi, and uh, small phi. These are uh, one-dimensional functions, and they are uh, also continuous, uh, and uh, you can also take, for example, this phi to be uh, monotonously increasing. 
So this is rather rather surprising result, if you want, because it means that somehow all the complexity of the i-dimensional function is hidden in those two one-dimensional things. So this is an exact statement? Yes. <laughs> it's Komogorov. You know. Of course, I mean, uh, this is uh, a beautiful mathematical result, but in practice it's not necessarily useful in the sense that the, those functions can have a, a very complicated fractal structure and they, um, all the complexity in computing, if you want, this f is hidden in computing this one, these one-dimensional functions. So in practice, from a, from a complexity point of view, uh, you are still, uh, you know, you are dealing still with the same complexity. But still, this gives you an idea of the fact uh, that's what I want to. Uh, P goes from what? From P from one to n again, n is again the dimension of uh, of the the number of variables there. Uh, the lambdas uh, they are between zero and one. It's just yeah, just coefficients. Um, um, but. The, the important thing that, that I wanted to show here, uh, that I wanted to stress with these results and uh, actually uh, why this is the somehow related to machine learning, is that uh, we immediately see from these uh, that uh, uh, taking, uh, uh, if you want, functions of functions, so like uh, uh, combinations of functions, um, is uh, an extremely powerful object that allows, it allows us to represent uh, in a much more compact way than just taking linear combinations, if you want, of basis functions an arbitrarily i-dimensional function. And this thing has been discovered, if you want, independently also by nature, in a sense, uh, since uh, um, uh, basically neural networks, which are, if you want, like a very simplified way of describing the, uh, the brain, uh, work in a way which is similar to forming a function of functions of functions. Right, so, so this is what, uh, um, where the connection between these two worlds of pure mathematics and uh, machine learning comes. Because uh, what, what is going to be important in the following is the notion of artificial neural network. Sorry, what about you? <coughs> the, the, the thing you started with, this polynomial? Ah, right, yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so at the end, I mean, these guys managed to show that uh, it's true that you cannot write the root as a, as a simple algebraic form, but you can write it as a composite function, so it's still a relatively compact. Uh, but is there something special about this example it shows? Or? No, this was the original motivation that that, uh, that then uh, uh, Arnold and the Komogorov Komo and then uh, the, then Arnold later. Just ignorant. Is it important you had a seventh order polynomial, or is it just an example? It's important. It's larger than four, if you want. Is that the idea? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. So in this case, they were able to find exactly the function. Yes. So so I, I yes. Okay. So in this case, uh, I think that they were able to find exactly those two phi and the uh, capital small capital. But this, the result was more general, and it can be extended to an arbitrary high-dimensional function. So that was the, the main statement. Now, uh, the point is, so uh, what I'm going to use in the following is uh, an artificial neural network. So an artificial neural network can be seen uh, basically as a high-dimensional function. So basically, I will deal again with uh, an f of, uh, n of, of x1, x2, uh, up to xn. And I will represent basically these, uh, those input variables as like basically dots, okay? So you can think of those as, uh, for example, uh, real, uh, real values, right? Uh, and uh, what this network does basically is that it takes uh, this input and it transforms it through uh, a, a nonlinear circuit, which is basically a function of a function of a function. So how does this work? Well, basically, the idea is that each, uh, each, uh, each um, neuron, so I, I assume that each of these input is, uh, is a neuron in, uh, in, the, in this artificial neural network, takes uh, the, the input and transforms it into, uh, into a linear combination. So basically, it takes a linear combination. So there will be a lot of variables that will go through, for example, the next layer of neurons. So, so th those are the input variables. So basically, they are just inputs for this network. And then uh, each, of those, um, each of those neurons, is each of those input, is fed into this, the second layer of neurons. So basically what this means is that, for example, uh, this variable here that I can call, for example, y1, y2, and y3, y4, etc., is basically uh, a function, so more formally I can say that yj uh, 
is equal to some uh, su from function, so, so some nonlinear function of uh, the linear combination that it's uh, coming inside this, those variables. Okay, so for example, this will be a linear combination of all the way with some weights uh, of the input variables plus a bias term. But it's the same phi for all of them. Yes, so in typical applications, we take the same, uh, the same phi, okay? So you see that this somehow resembles this, uh, this object that I was, uh, that I was uh, using before. And then the idea is that you can uh, compose uh, these, uh, those variables at the, ne at the next level. So, and in particular, you can define, for example, another layer of neurons that we can go to Z1, Z2, up to ZK, which is again, uh, if you want, uh, again, a function of a linear combination now of those, of those YJ, right? With some other weights, generally. So, so <coughs> J and K of my uh, YJ with some other bias term, which is K. So you see the idea. The idea is that at the end, so you take your initial uh, input, so this i-dimensional uh, vector, and you transform it through a sequence of functions of functions, taking at each step linear combinations of those variables. Okay? Uh, not necessarily. This is uh, the simplest case where we take the same phase, but you don't need to. So the main point now is that um, um, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from nature, we know that basically those kind of functions, so those phi of x, are typically, uh, first of all, uh, continuous functions because they come from uh, the biology, if you want, uh, of, the, of the brain and in particular of the, of the neuron. But uh, what we know is that there are those, those objects which are called activation functions, are typically uh, functions which uh, that, that are called activation functions because they are, uh, for example, as a function of x, they are typically zero for if the signal is smaller than some uh, threshold value, which can be changed to tune the changing this bias term b. And then they activate, they spike if you want, uh, if you are dealing with a neuron, if this threshold, if the, if the value of the input is larger than some, uh, than some threshold. So, but it's very important that this, thing, this object is non-linear. Otherwise, if you uh, deal with uh, linear uh, phis, uh, you are somehow back into the case of just a linear combination of basis, of basis functions, which is not as powerful as taking uh, functions of functions. But to, to go back to your motivating example, yeah. you, you mentioned that, that Arnold and they found that the, 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 the phis could be fractal or could have so in the general case, uh, those this phi is uh, is continuous. But if, f <coughs> is, if the, the initial f, if f of x one through x n is continuous or smooth, d does that guarantee that the no phi, the f no. no okay so that's uh, the tricky part. So if f is uh, is continuous, uh, uh, I mean if it's uh, I don't know Lipschitz or something, it doesn't mean that uh, you can find the phi which is Lipschitz. Actually, at the end, but the point is that in practical applications, we have to fix the form of this phi to something we can work with, for example, an hyperbolic tangent or something. Uh, and then in that case, of course, this theorem breaks in the sense that uh, this sum uh, does not go to n, but to a larger number, which is not necessarily of order n. It can be, in general, uh, exponentially large in n, actually. But still, this is uh, the motivating idea why we want to use functions of functions. So in this way, you avoid loops and feedback loops? Yes, you can also insert uh, feedback loops if you want. And this uh, actually increases the, the, the computational power of these, uh, of, these, uh, of these networks. So you can show that if you introduce loops, uh, you have uh, uh, a much more powerful uh, um, machine in terms of uh, computational complexity. But in this case, it's not 
But isn't uh, the feedback included in the non-linearity? Exactly. It depends what you mean by feedback. But, uh, so the non-linearity of phi or function, general function, kind of takes care of the looping. Yeah. Mm. But by loop, I meant that uh, the output can be fed back into the input. Right. Um, but uh, so that's what I mean, and it's not included in this architecture, this specific one. But uh, um, yeah, we can discuss about this. So I mean, so this was this is the notion of artificial neural network that we will need that we'll need. Uh, uh, will be needed by us in the in the following. So let's see a little bit now what we can do uh, with those artificial neural networks and what kind of applications people have been done, uh, uh, let's say, in uh, in real life. So the easiest thing you can do is uh, the so-called supervised learning. Which is basically the simplest form of, uh, of machine learning that you can do. So the basic idea is that uh, uh, you can imagine that you have a task, so a generic task. So you want to automate a task, you want to solve a problem, and the solution of, to this problem is given by some uh, f bar, if you want, of some uh, input variables. So let me give you an example. Uh, imagine that my, um, my, my input, so as a vector x, is equal to, to a string, so the string is uh, uh, je suis, so in French, right? And you want that, uh, for example, that uh, given this string, f bar of, uh, of x is equal to i m, right? So, like the English translation of this uh, string. So this is a very um, specific example, but this is like, if you want, uh, a <coughs> a basic version of Google Translate. So Google Translate works more or less in this way. It takes a, a string in some language and translates it into another language. So this case is French from, uh, from English, but it can be whatever. So the goal, in the, if you want, in this case, uh, so the translator in this case, uh, the goal of the machine would be to find a good approximation of this f bar, of this unknown f bar, right? which is a very complicated high-dimensional function, if you want. So how can we do that? Well, the basic idea, the paradigm of, uh, of machine learning, is that we work with a large amount of data. So we have, uh, for example, uh, at end, um, um, a lot of pre-translated text, so if you want, in this context. But uh, formally, from a mathematical point of view, this means that I have a collection of, uh, uh, of, um, of labeled, uh, exam labeled examples, XL, and of uh, pre-translated uh, sentences. And I have a lot of them. So L is an integer which goes between, uh, I don't know, between 1 and uh, ns, where ns is, a, is a much larger than 1. So this means that I have a collection of pre-translated sentences. And uh, to each of those, I, I know what the for each of those, I know what the translation is, right? So if you want, I only have a partial knowledge of this function on those points, and I want to reconstruct, I want to infer the value, of the generic value of this function for some other strings that have not been uh, pre-translated before. So this is how Google Translate works. I mean, like uh, very in a very, um, at zero level, let's say, at zero order, that's how it works. Now, how do we do that? Well, this is basically, uh, as I was mentioning, an inference problem. Um, and the idea is that we define a, a loss function. So in general, I, I will have, what I want to do is that I want to approximate this unknown high dimensional function, so f bar of x, with uh, my uh, artificial neural network. So f uh, a and n, if you want, artificial neural network which in general will depend on some parameters p, some uh, parameters p, which can be, for example, those weights that I have inside my, my functions or whatever you want. So also the architecture of the network itself. Now, what I do is that, I mean, to, to, to solve this equation numerically, uh, as you can guess, is that I define a loss function, which depends on the, on the if you want, on the, on the parameters into the, in, in the network, which is basically just the sum of uh, my labeled examples of uh, basically the square loss or an, another uh, generic loss 
uh, basically of what I expect by as a new, the output of the of the neural network at the current values of the parameters minus uh, <coughs> the pre-translated thing, so the YL, so the, the output that I was expecting for those samples that I already have classified, okay? So now I have this function which depends on the parameters, I basically just minimize it and find the, the, the optimal value for those, uh, for those parameters. So this is the learning part, if you want, of the algorithm. So, there are two parts. So, in the, in the machine learning, there are two things. So, the machine, which is, uh, in this case, the artificial neural network, so this i-dimensional function, which depends on parameters p, on a set of parameters p, and the learning part, which is basically an optimization problem. So, it's an i-dimensional optimization problem where we want to minimize some quantity, in particular, in this case, the, this loss function. Okay? So one of the um, uh, interesting aspects is that this optimization is done in, uh, in a stochastic way. So I will just uh, uh, briefly sketch this because it's uh, somehow interesting. And in particular... Um, uh, Giuseppe, when you have uh, something non-linear, I mean, yeah, pretty, pretty messy, yeah. I have to say, uh, you might have many minima, right? Yeah, that's precisely where I want to go. Very good point. So the idea is that uh, that's exactly the, the, the problem, um, but uh, it's solved in a very <coughs> elegant way. And I would say that people in the machine learning community uh, were not aware of this uh, from a, a physical perspective uh, until very recently. But somehow, it's very if, if you are a physicist, you can realize why the optimization uh, algorithm they have works so well and avoids local minima. And the idea is the following. Basically, what they did, what people use to, to optimize this i-dimensional function is just uh, a, uh, a wrong version of the, of, the, of the gradient descent, right? So in general, the gradient descent tells, tells you that... Uh, the gradient descent tells you that uh, if you are at uh, iteration k and you want to find the, the parameters at iteration k plus 1, basically you take the old set of parameters and you, uh, you subtract, basically, uh, eta is a small parameter, which uh, they call the learning rate. You basically subtract, subtract the gradient of this function that we want to, to minimize, right? So let me call it g uh, of p. So g is a vector itself. So this is the standard uh, gradient descent approach. You know that this thing will, uh, will converge to a local minimum of the, of the function. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, what, they, what, this, uh, what, what the people in the machine learning community do... Second. Uh, now it's going to be problematic. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, never mind. So, uh, so the G of P... <laughs> so... <w> <laughs> So instead, so I mean, wh what these people were doing, uh, I mean, wh what, what is done uh, in, the, in the community of uh, the machine learning is that instead of taking the full gradient, so the full gradient would be the sum over all the examples that you have in your, uh, in your, uh, in your, uh, in your library of pre-translated uh, strings, if you want. So let me call it G, uh, G, L, G of uh, X, L, and P, right? So probably small g. Okay, so you see that basically if you take the gradient of those individual terms in the sum, it's ju just a small gradient here. So what, pe what uh, it's, uh, it's commonly uh, done is that instead of taking the full sum, we approximate this full sum with a partial sum over a batch, so over a number of samples which is, which is much smaller than the, the total number of samples. So L over N and batch, batch. So where MB is much smaller than NS, okay? So typically it can be 100 or 50 even, of uh, this, this thing. Now, this means in practice that instead of taking the full gradient, we are taking a stochastic approximation of the gradient. So this means that th th instead of taking the full gradient, we now have, uh, um, we now have a, 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 
what, what's called the stochastic gradient descent, uh, if you want, uh, uh, gradient, which is equal to, to the exact gradient g of p plus a sigma. So plus, uh, if you want, a normal uh, distribution uh, we, we give it, we, with uh, basically with, vari with, uh, okay, so with, with variant sigma. Where this variant sigma, so let's assume now that all the components of the gradient are uncorrelated just to be, to be on the safe side, I mean on the easy side, where this sigma basically scales like one over the number of, uh, of samples that I've taken here in this small batch. Okay, but it turns out that if you do this thing with a noisy gradient and you put it back here in the, so in the standard gradient descent, you end up with a Langevin equation. So uh, a stochastic differential equation, the, 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 the time discretized version of the, Lang of the Langevin equation, where at the, 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 the step k plus one, you take your old parameter p of k, um, basically minus eta, uh, the true gradient g of p, minus uh, eta, um, this uh, normal, uh, this normal uh, uh, variable. And this can be easily identified with the, with the, with the standard, with the Langevin equation, since um, if, we, if, we, if we make now the, 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 the simple substitution that eta, so this learning rate, is a time step in time, so delta tau, and that uh, the, the, this sigma, so basically the variance in my, in my gradient, is equal to, uh, um, to, actually sigma square is equal to twice the temperature over delta tau, the time step. So this is the first order Langevin equation. And the important point is that uh, and in, the, in the asymptotic regime, what is sampled by this uh, first order Langevin equation is uh, basically the probability of finding a certain set of parameters p is, uh, is proportional to the exponential or minus uh, um, uh, the, the, this loss equation, so L of p over uh, t. Depends much on the barrier, though. Yes, yes. No, but what, what I'm what I'm saying. No, but no, this is this statement is true. If the components of the gradient are all uncorrelated, it's always true that the probability distribution sampled by this uh, by this uh, stochastic differential equation is the is the Boltzmann uh, equation, where the energy, the effective energy, is the loss function. So here, uh, the benefit of adding a noise, if you want, is that instead of doing a simple uh, standard optimization uh, gradient descent, we are doing, uh, basically, uh, we are exploring the full, uh, if you want, uh, uh, classical energy uh, spanned by those, uh, by those parameters, P. And in particular, what we can do, and that what people do uh, to optimize those parameters, um, is that we can change the effective temperature in the system. So, for example, if we anneal the value of beta, so if we slowly turn it down, it's completely equivalent to changing uh, the temperature. So, if we change the, the temperature, we can then uh, go into the, the global minimum of this function. So, it's much easier to optimize the, uh, the, the, this neural network that we are dealing with. So, we have a double benefit, because this is also intrinsically much uh, faster to compute numerically, but we, also, we are also approaching the actual uh, minimum of the function we want to optimize. Okay, so this was, uh, let's say, the physical interpretation of the, of the stochastic Newton descent, which is, I, I, find it I find particularly nice. Yes. So, physical interpretation might be useful to, for, especially for us, but um, when, when I look at the cost function, yes. do I want to think that this has to do anything to do with the Lagrangian? Uh, no, the, na the name L is uh, loss, not. <laughs> sure, sure, but what I'm saying is that this, <coughs> there is no notion of locality there, probably. Uh, no, no, uh, precisely because these n connections in the networks uh, can be highly non-local, so typically, so yes. <coughs> our physical intuition mm -hmm. is probably, for most of us, built on, on local objects, or on local Lagrangians or Hamiltonians. Should be, should we... No, the only interpretation, the physical interpretation you, t you can take from here is that uh, you are dealing with uh, 
a classical uh, Lagrangian, I mean, a classical energy, which is uh, yeah, highly non-local. Uh, but uh, I mean, the interpretation you can take here is that the annealing, uh, the, the, the procedure you're using is like a simulated annealing for, uh, for Hamiltonian, which is unphysical. Yeah, I agree. But the fact that it's non local may even be helpful because it helps thermalize faster right. as opposed to. Uh, no, it helps describing more complex functions. For example, in the, in the case of uh, quantum systems. I <laughs> what I want to know is if I can uh, take my intuitions about thermalization in physics. Ah, right. right to here, uh, whether the fact that this is not local, this cost function is not local, it's going to be an obstruction to that, or actually it's going to make thermalization even. I, th I think that locality is not necessarily something that uh, is related to how fast or how many local minima you have in this uh, high dimensional thing. Uh, at least that's not how I, I see it. But, but, but in practice, it's true that uh, the, the best networks that people have studied and uh, are using are have some, this notion of locality somehow built in. So these convolutional neural networks, for example, have local filters and th those are also easier to optimize. So in a sense, it, may, it might be that uh, the two things go together, that somehow locality helps optim optimizing, yeah. But I guess that's if your function has some natural locality, like for image processing maybe, but not for a... Yes, not yes. For yeah, uh, so yeah, I mean, um, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. So if you have, uh, let's say, a low, uh, slightly entangled input, uh, <laughs> if we anticipate already the, the, the following discussion, then it's clear that uh, a, uh, a local uh, a, a function with some local uh, structure is better. Yeah. There are other other cases that behave like uh, spin glasses where there's like uh, a trouble finding the, the glasses? Uh, yes, certainly yes. Uh, there are cases where it's very hard to optimize those functions. It takes uh, days, years. Uh, so, so, and the people have studied this from the perspective of spin glass system. There are, there's a lot of literature on this, actually. I can give you the references. Okay, now. There is still some instrument to get the Oops. Mm. Thank you. I'm fishing. Uh, would, it be, oops, would it be possible to turn the lights off, please? Um, just to, to show you a little bit some slides. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, OK. So what I wanted to say, it's OK. So basically, this idea that you have a function uh, uh, which uh, allows you to solve uh, a complex problem can be generalized to many other problems, not only to uh, language translation. Uh, for example, uh, um, optical character recognition. In this case, the input is the, the, the image and the output would be the, uh, the digitalized version of the, of the input, if you want. Uh, or speech recognition, so the input is a, wa a wave uh, sound and then the output is the, the string of text and all other things, sort of things that you can think. So this thing, this approach is very general. It's really uh, something that can be applied to a lot of, of, um, of applications. Now, um, that's why, for example, uh, uh, machine learning, since this approach is very general, uh, that's why also uh, people have started using this approach in, uh, in many domains of science. For example, in the case of uh, particle physics, one can use this machine learning approach to, um, to help spot events in a sea of, ev of events that happens in, a, in an accelerator and try to identify those and see whether they are associated or not with some, uh, for example, Higgs boson or to design molecules, all sorts of things. But uh, I mean, just to, and people, I mean, <laughs> have started wondering whether uh, at the end, like uh, having a machine that is able to to solve the problem for us would somehow transform the scientific method itself, right? Because if we have a machine which <laughs> decides for us whether, um, uh, you know, uh, like a problem has been solved or not, or whether uh, this molecule is going to be this or this other thing, at some point we're, go we're going to have also uh, probably a shift in the scientific method. But of course we are not there yet. So um, I w just wanted to, uh, to discuss with you um, for example, uh, one of the first applications people have been uh, that, that have been done in the context of condensed matter, which is uh, very recent, 
so the idea here is that we can use uh, this kind of approach, so this kind of uh, uh, supervised learning, so where we basically minimize this loss function, uh, to identify phases of matter. So you can think that in this case, my, um, my input uh, are, for example, uh, images or something of uh, different uh, objects. And you want th this, uh, this algorithm to identify whether these, uh, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those input images are uh, in a certain phase of the matter, for example, solid, liquid, solid, liquid, etc. So we have uh, um, a set of pre-classified images, if you want, in this case, so where x1 is already associated to a solid, uh, x2 to a liquid, and so on. And so we can do this procedure of basically minimizing this loss function over this finite set of uh, pre-classified images. And then we can ask, uh, we can give a new image and say, uh, hey, what do you think this is? Is it a solid or a liquid, right? So this is the basic idea of <laughs> uh, how to we can use, uh, in this context, uh, the machine learning technique to, to classify phases. Uh, from uh, on a more refined level, that's what uh, Juan Carasquilla and uh, Roger Melko have been doing uh, uh, last year. Uh, uh, basically published in this paper, uh, and, and uh, as a toy example, I mean, as a, as a more concrete physical example than, uh, than those images I was showing you before, they took the, the, the Ising model. So basically you take as, an Im as input configurations, basically samples taken from the classical partition function of the Ising model, so this x1, x2, x3, x4, and those images are taken at different temperatures in the, in the phase diagram of the, of the, of the Ising uh, model. And basically, at each of for each of those images, um, uh, one can one can pre-classify them and say, for example, that those uh, were obtained uh, when the temperature was lower than the critical temperature, so they, are, they were in the ordered phase. So the, the label was y1, y2, which is ordered, and then those other phases instead were in the disordered phase, right? So we have again this large chunk of data that we've taken and we have pre-classified, and then we use a, a machine to to see whether, uh, for example, it is able to, to, uh, to identify uh, this phase transition uh, on, uh, on, an, on another model, for example. So in this case, uh, they trained the model on a square lattice, so really the, the, the machine was able to, to identify the, uh, the, the phase transition in the, in the Ising model on the square lattice, and then they took the very same machine and they applied it to the, to the Ising model on the, on the triangular lattice where it was able to predict the, the, the phase transition, so the critical temperature with, with very good accuracy. So basically, uh, the output that the machine was giving was compatible with, uh, with, uh, with the exact known results uh, from, from other Monte Carlo simulations. So the basic idea here is that the machine was able to learn the, the order parameter in the, uh, the magnetization, if you want, in the, in the system, and use it to learn a phase transition in another system where it was not previously uh, trained on. So that's the idea. Uh, the the learning yeah. here is on the visual part or just yeah, including no. I don't know magnetization and see if it's there. no it's just on the on the on the bare uh, spin configurations oh, visual. just visual so you treat if you want those things as images and you classify them with uh, either zero or one if they're ordered or uh, unordered it's not uh, simpler just to compute the magnetization but because you are a physicist and you know that uh, the order parameter is the magnetization but the idea is that we want the the machine to find out that the the, the order parameter is the magnetization so that's the, the idea how, how big was their training database uh, uh i i honestly don't remember in this case uh, we, we should have a look at the paper it's in the thousands i guess yeah. how do you reformat the triangular lattice so that a configuration on the triangular lattice looks like, I mean, it's... Ah, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> actually, I should ask... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. In order to, t for the machine to make a prediction, it has to take as input something yeah. that can be compared to sure. how it was trained. So probably take the dots, you pick, I don't know, you have data points. Well, yeah, but uh, you can probably just do a simple... Uh, I mean, it's the same extra diagonals. Yeah, so yeah. You just take the same pattern. So the uniform magnetization probably does not matter how yeah. you map it. Right, right. So no, but I mean, uh, what, what you were saying is uh, how do you map uh, a square on a triangle as, a, as, a, as the input image? Yeah, and, and whether that can affect the result of... Uh, like, you mean, yeah, I think they were taking something like that, like... Yeah, well, but I guess, <laughs> but I don't know, I have to check the what, what one did. Uh, no, but then we have a problem here. Pro no, like this, yeah, I think. 
Just a like this, yeah. Diagonal in one yes, yes. So I think yeah, you can do this kind of, uh, yeah. Great. So, um, so this was one of the uh, first applications of those ideas to um, classifying phases of matter. It has been also used for other things. Uh, but uh, now what I would like to do is to show what we did uh, um, in the context of uh, quantum mechanics, like to really find, uh, if you want, the ground state of some uh, Hamiltonian, possibly a correlated Hamiltonian, um, and to see how we can use uh, machine learning to, uh, to, to solve this problem. So. Okay, so, uh, so what's the goal, so what's the thing that we would like to solve? Well, uh, <coughs> we have a, a, a Hamiltonian, so we have a many-body Hamiltonian, say we have the Albert model uh, or the Eisenberg model, and uh, uh, one of the main tasks that we would like to solve, that we would like the machine to give us um, some help for, is to find the ground state of this Hamiltonian, right? So we would like to find, uh, if you want, <coughs> this Psi which solves the, the Schrodinger equation the ground state of this, uh, of, this, uh, of this object. So in order to use a machine learning approach, the first thing that we have to do is to um, somehow change or, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation into an optimization problem, so something which is suitable for the, for the learning uh, approaches that I was discussing before. But this is uh, something which is relatively easy to do. We know indeed that the ground state of the, of the Hamiltonian uh, is uh, nothing but the, uh, the, the minimum. Uh, over all the possible, uh, if you want, uh, many body uh, physical uh, ground states uh, of the energy functional uh, E of Psi, right? So we're basically, uh, we're basically E of Psi is nothing but the expectation value of the Hamiltonian over some uh, uh, normalizable uh, physical state, Psi, right? So in principle, we already know from the variational principle uh, that uh, if we manage to, um, we, we, have, we can immediately transform, if you want, the, the, uh, the, the sharing equation into an optimization problem. So if you want the learning part of transforming uh, the, the quantum, me quantum mechanics into a learning problem is already, uh, it comes from, uh, from free, uh, from, uh, thanks to the, to, the, to the variational principle. Now, uh, the, other, uh, the other part that we need is, um, uh, is the machine, right? Because, um, there are several possibilities that, uh, there are several ways we can use, uh, for example, machine learning or in general um, uh, neural networks to, to solve this, uh, this problem. So one, one a possibility would be that, for example, we solve uh, um, uh, for the Schrodinger equation for some Hamiltonian and then we try to, to find the solution for some other Hamiltonians. So in the spirit of what I've des described before. So we solve for all the Eisenberg models and then we say, ah, but what's the ground state for the Eisenberg model? But of course you can understand that the machine will get confused because the, the two things are not necessarily well, well connected also from a physical point of view. So what we do instead is that, uh, that was our idea, is that we represent the, 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 the many body state as an artificial neural network. So what we do, uh, basically is that, uh, first of all, we introduce uh, some many-body basis for, for my problem. So, for example, let's assume that I have a spin one-half problem and that my many-body basis is just a collection of uh, n uh, uh, spin numbers uh, along the, the z direction, okay? So sigma 1 up to sigma z. Uh, and then uh, what I do uh, is that I represent the, the many-body state, so basically uh, those, uh, those amplitudes, psi of x, as uh, an artificial neural network. So in particular, uh, I will call those amplitudes, which are in general complex valued because I want to describe the most general uh, wave function. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a function, if you want, in this case of all my magnetizations, so along the z direction for all the sites that I have in my system. So basically what I do is that I want to approximate the exact ground state, so in general a state of, of my, which is associated to my Hamiltonian, with some artificial neural network, right? So uh, for a reason that will be, will be apparent uh, in a moment, what I will do is actually that I will uh, associate uh, the, expo the, the, the log, if you want, of the wave function with an artificial neural network. So what I will do is that I will say that uh, uh, my artificial neural network describes the log of the wave function. And this log of the wave function 
will depend again on some parameters p. So these parameters p can be, for example, the, connect the connectivity matrix that I have in my network, can be whatever you have in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a parameter in your, uh, in your artificial neural network. And I mean, from, uh, from a more general perspective, from a physics perspective, those parameters now become variational parameters for my variational wave function, which is now in the form of, of an artificial neural network. So uh, what I can do now is that uh, uh, I, can, uh, uh, I can find the ground state of this, uh, of this uh, Hamiltonian, for example, uh, solving an uh, a learning problem, an optimization problem, which is uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in a very similar form of the, of the optimization problem that we've seen before. It's more complicated, but uh, the, the idea is more or less the same. <laughs> And in particular, uh, the, the main ingredient that you need to know is that if you want to compute, for example, the expectation value of the energy for a given set of uh, parameters, okay, so if I call E of P, again, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian for a given uh, set of parameters divided by the, the normalization, then this object can be written in a stochastic way, so as a Monte Carlo average, if you want, over uh, configurations, so over many body spin configurations, which are sampled according to um, psi of, uh, of, uh, of x, so x now again is my many body variable which indicates uh, all the magnetization of p square, so modulus square of this, uh, times uh, an estimator which is called uh, the local energy in, uh, in jargon. So in practice, you can show that, uh, and that the local energy, I mean, just to, to show you what it is, in practice, is defined very easily as the, the sum over the basically all the non-zero elements uh, for which the, those uh, matrix elements of the Hamiltonian are non-zero, of psi over x prime and p in general over psi of x and p. Okay, so this is the definition of the local energy. So basically, uh, what this expression is telling you, and you can easily derive it, is that the, ex the quantum expectation value of the Hamiltonian can be written as a statistical expectation value over this probability distribution, uh, psi square, of uh, some object which is not a classical energy. It's an, uh, somehow an effective classical energy that people call uh, the local energy. Okay? So in a sense, you can uh, recast the full quantum mechanical problem into a fully classical problem where the classical energy that corresponds to the quantum one is this local energy. And in particular, what you can do, so this is the heart of the variational Monte Carlo approach, and at the end, what you can do is that you can also compute uh, the gradients of the, of, this of, this, uh, of the expectation value of the energy, and you can minimize it in the same way we were doing for the other quantities, okay? So this is uh, uh, how uh, this, uh, this approach works, uh, basically. The Yes, so I train the machine, uh, so at each step, so this approach works as well. So the first one is that we sample, so we fix the, the parameters in my network, the P's, and I, I sample from, so I, sa I generate a lot of, uh, of samples psi of x, which are generated according to the current wave function squared. Okay, so those are generated, for example, via a Markov chain Monte, Ca Monte Carlo. So I generate a lot of samples which are generated according to psi square. Then, uh, using those samples, I use basically the gradient uh, computed as an expectation value, statistical expectation values, to feed back the parameters. So basically I will say that p at uh, k plus one, so at the next step, will be equal to p of k minus some uh, estimation of the gradient, stochastic estimation of the gradient that I have at, sta at, at, uh, at step k. So this stochastic estimation of the gradient is obtained using the samples that I have generated in one. And then I, I go back to one because I've changed my parameters, I resample and then until I converge to the minimum. So it's a more complicated than what I've shown you before in the sense that here, uh, this is a self-consistent procedure where I don't have pre-labeled examples of the solution that I want to find. I have to generate my them myself. So it's more similar to, uh, to have a, a machine which learns how to play a game for example, if you have the, the game uh, of Go, 
your, your, uh, which is the, the one that uh, Google excelled uh, last year. Um, basically, it happens that there you have uh, an energy, so you have uh, some, uh, some function that you want to minimize, that you want to maximize, which is the, the final score that you get in that game. So and but in that sense, you don't have a, a winning uh, trajectory. You don't have a winning strategy beforehand. You have to find it yourself in a self-consistent way. For example, playing against yourself. And it is the same idea here. So we are playing against uh, Schrodinger until we beat it and we find uh, the, best, uh, the best energy. So uh, let me show you just some uh, uh, numerical results. Before the numerical results. So you said this is variational Monte Carlo using yes. an artificial neural network yes. as a variational answer. Yes. Is that yes. A, and, and so the question is whether this is a good answer? Is that yes. And do you have, so now we look at the numerical? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so there are some in principle reasons why this is a good answer and there are some uh, numerical evidence. So, uh, so I think the answer is yes. It's a complementary answer if you want to to MPS or tensor networks. No, no, but if somebody knows variational Monte Carlo, all they have to do is to, to, to choose this as their yeah, variational yeah. wave function. Right. Yes. And the selling point would be the numerics or there is some... No, the, the selling point is that you can increase systematically, if you want, the precision of this object, increasing the capacity of the network. So you can put more and more neurons and uh, systematically converge to the ground state. So in a sense, like the, sen the, the sites of the network is uh, the dual of the bond dimension in the, in the, in the, in the MPS. Language. The number of sites, in the the number of, uh, of sites, yeah, the number of neurons that you have in the in the network uh, in the in the deep part. Right. So I'm going to discuss this. In a okay, okay. We have a quick follow-up question there. For MPS, we actually know that they capture like the properties of local Hamiltonians, and that's why this yeah. is the right ansatz maybe to <coughs> represent ground states of local right. Hamiltonians. Absolutely. But this ansatz doesn't have locality. But is there still like a reasoning why this would be the right or efficient? A pro uh, efficient ansatz for ground states of local Hamiltonians, or would it be the same? Like if it is, for example, I, I was expecting this question. But no, I mean, no. The, the problem is that uh, um, the fact that this thing is not local is also beneficial because you can describe more easily highly entangled states. <coughs> so here you don't have a limitation in the sense that if you have a volume low state, you can uh, efficiently describe it uh, with a polynomial number of, uh, of parameters. Because if you take long-range connections, it's trivial that you satisfy a volume law. Right. So in this sense, uh, having do not, having not having localities can be an advantage to describe, for example, chiral states and those kind of things where you can have a strong volume law. But uh, from, from for, for there is a way of recovering locality. I mean, I will go there in a second. Just. But where it, whether it's local or local, it depends on the architecture. And you yes, so, so at the end it may even be that the architecture that is found, which is found by the, the network is effectively local. So we are giving the freedom to be not local, but at the end uh, the network is free to choose <coughs> to be local. Of course, if you constrain to be local, it might be easier to optimize. So that's the, the thing we were discussing. Yeah. So, so is it the right time to ask whether you will have any computational problem when trying to evaluate this, this network? Uh, yeah, okay, so... Uh, Numerics first? Yeah, so, so first I, I, I wanted to discuss... Uh, okay, so the... Um, uh, no, just a second. <laughs> so the actual answers that we use is, uh, is of this uh, restricted Boltzmann machine, RBM form. So in this case, basically, uh, what we do is that we take uh, um, this phi to be, I mean, the log of, uh, I mean, if you can derive it like that, basically it's just the log of the hyperbolic cosine of, uh, of x. So this is the activation function that we use, and this activation function comes from uh, some effective uh, Boltzmann uh, distribution uh, of uh, an object which is done like that. So where you have your input nodes, sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma n. So those are my physical degrees of freedom, which are connected through some, uh, some weights, so those Ws. Okay, and, and uh, to some hidden nodes, H1 up to Hn, Hm, so where M is a free parameter. So the more of those I put, the more, the, the, the bigger network. And basically I say that uh, um, uh, the output of my, of basically the wave function of my system, so Psi of X, Psi of Sigma in this case, is nothing but the Boltzmann weight associated with this object. So it's basically the sum over the, these uh, hidden variables of the exponential of sum over j 
W, I, J, sigma, uh, sigma I, H, J. So basically this is a, a classical partition function where I have interactions between my physical variables and some hidden degrees of freedom which are the neurons in the network if you want. Okay? So the more of those I put, the larger the brain if you want this artificial network is and the, the smarter I can make it. So there are actual representation theorems that guarantee that if m is large enough I can represent any uh, n-dimensional dimension, n function. Okay, so now I have this parameter m, and in particular I have uh, what I call alpha, which is the ratio between uh, m and uh, the physical number of values, so n, m, m over n, that I can play with. So I can increase alpha and increase the accuracy of my calculation. So if you can uh, now... <laughs> the complex numbers are coming from somewhere here? Yes, so those, the w's are complex valued. So, the, of course, the, the interpretation as a classical partition function breaks down at this point. Yeah. And this is something which makes th uh, this thing very different from traditional applications that people have done in the, in the classical context. So what we did more, if you want, is to, to put this object complex. Um, so, okay, so here you can see, for example, the energy as a function of this uh, iteration number when we optimize the, the energy for the one-dimensional Eisenberg model. So this is a model where you can do numerics with uh, the MRG, or you can even find the exact ground state with uh, um, uh, basically better answers. So you can see that uh, uh, when we increase alpha, we can systematically improve the accuracy. So from this plot, you cannot see it very well, but you see, um, basically, you see it here. So this is a zoom of the final part of my iterations of my optimization. You can see, for example, that going from alpha equal 2 to alpha equal 4, the energy goes down. And you can also see from the scale that we are very close to, uh, you know, we have a very uh, high accuracy on the, on the ground state energy. So you see, for example, that uh, the scale is... Uh so what is alpha? So alpha, yeah, sorry, it's introduced here. I introduced it here very briefly. So it's the ratio of the number of hidden units over the number of visible units. So it's, if you want, it's how many neurons you have uh, after the input layer. So the larger it is, the better it is, uh, the, the better you find the ground state. So this is, uh, I think this is uh, 80 sites, but you can do 80, yes, 80 still. Uh, so, but you can see it also for other models. So this is the relative error you, you do on the, on, the, on the energy, on the ground state energy as a function of alpha. For example, for one dimensional model, we typically find more or less a power law uh, behavior as a function of, uh, of alpha. So this is a log-log plot. Uh, and you see, uh, for example, for the 1D transverse field Dyson model, for different values of the transverse field that you can uh, systematically converge, typically also to very large accuracies. Um, and uh, you see that alpha equal 4, it's uh, not necessarily a very large number, but you can uh, already achieve a very, very typically very high accuracies. And a very interesting thing, which I believe is uh, somehow um, also worth uh, being explored more, is that this is a rather compact representation of the, of the wave function. For example, if you compare this, uh, the, the equivalent MPS, which has the same uh, um, uh, accuracy, um, for example, for H equal 1 on the, on the, uh, on the critical point, um, or t or say 10 to the minus 4, and you say how many parameters I have in this MPS, and you compare the number of parameters that we have in the, in the RPM, you see that they can be easily a factor of, uh, of, of 100 or uh, sometimes even more. So in a sense, the fact that we have uh, a nonlinear decomposition of the wave function uh, can be more expressive than, uh, than a multilinear decomposition like the MPS. Of course, it means also that it's harder to optimize. So on this, uh, we, I think we, we agree. Now, uh, the, the thing is that, of course, in 2D, it's more problematic in the sense that uh, converging is more delicate, as you can see here. Uh, uh, we, we still managed to do a bit better than, uh, than uh, some uh, um, uh, PEPs results. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, harder than 1D. So this is something also that is not uh, entirely understood at the moment, why the optimization is harder in 2D. Um, most likely it's not a limitation of the answers itself, but it's uh, an optimization issue due to, the, to the, this high dimensional uh, uh, space where we are optimizing our parameters. Uh, okay, so this I don't want to go too much into the details, but basically what I wanted to show you is that in some cases you can see that the weights that come out are local. For example, in the two-dimensional Eisenberg model, uh, you can see that those weights have a local structure which is somehow reminiscent of the, of the local antiferromagnetic correlations that you have in the system. So, sorry, how, how do we read that plot? Yeah, this, I didn't want to go too much into the detail, but 
So basically, here we also use translation symmetry in the system. So this W now uh, depends only on one index. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, you have to imagine this as a convolutional neural network. I don't know if you've heard about it, but basically you have a filter that you translate at each, uh, at each time. Uh, but okay, th this is a bit technical. I didn't want to discuss yeah, this. But W14 is a weight, is a number, or it's it's a weight. Yeah. So this is the this weight here, basically. And why does it? How? What does it mean? That's a complex number. Uh, so this means. Uh, yeah. No. Sorry. So, so he, this is the the um, uh, in the case of the Asimov model, you can take it purely real because you know that uh, if you do the rotation, uh, you can put it uh, purely real to for the ground state. So what does it mean that a given coefficient has a representation in two dimensions? Ah, because this is a two-dimensional Eisenberg model. So, I, 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 so <laughs> what, I, what I'm doing is that here, uh, basically, I'm fixing, uh, if you want, J. So I'm fixing the hidden unit and I'm varying I. So this I now is a two-dimensional index. So I'm, so I'm fixing the, the index of the hidden unit. So I'm fixing, for example, this hidden unit and I'm showing the value of this weight over all the other spins, which is a two-dimensional object. Is it? Should we think of it as just some sort of indication that the wave function has some degree of locality? Yes, yes, yes. yes. In this case, yes, but it's not, always, it's not always the case. For example, if you look at this, <laughs> uh, for the Asimov 1D, uh, the, the weight is highly not local. And we've seen clearly that uh, it depends strongly on how you optimize the wave function. So if you force it to be local, it stays local. So this is something also interesting. But is that with periodic boundary condition? This is th those are all with, uh, with periodic boundaries. Because then it still shows to be local, no? Uh, no in this case, uh, uh, well, okay, okay. It's true that th this filter, for example, is uh, is relatively centered into this point, yeah. But less than, let's say, this one is. <laughs> Anyway, uh, what I wanted to say, okay, if you want, you can also have a look at uh, some codes that uh, are online uh, that I wrote to, to somehow um, show how to, to apply this, uh, this scheme, numerical scheme for the ASIM model and other cases. A more general code will be uh, hopefully uploaded uh, uh, before next uh, spring, so where you can really play with it and uh, also extend it if you want. Um, okay, no, now I think that uh, my time is, uh, is almost... It's basically finished. Uh, I wanted to say that we can do also unit dynamics. Uh, I don't have time to discuss this, <coughs> but we can also do um, uh, solve the time-dependent uh, shading equation using the time-dependent variational Monte Carlo. It's a method that we developed some time ago. Um, and then, yeah, okay. In, uh, in our paper, we we compared also unit dynamics to the exact results and found that also in this case, it's more delicate, but you can also find very good results for the dynamics. This is a quantum quench. Uh, you can use also, also it in two dimensions, and that's something which is coming out. Okay, and then uh, I don't have time to discuss this, but we have also applications to, to s basically tomographies, which is the problem of reconstructing the state of a quantum system from uh, given experimental measurements. Okay, so for, the, for, for I guess, uh, some of you who are interested in, uh, in the properties of those states, we can discuss them later, and uh, I apologize, but uh, I, I, I ran out of time. In particular, we can describe. Uh, I, I can we can discuss uh, some applications that people have done um, to chiral spin liquids, where this ansatz has been shown uh, to be uh, <laughs> superior to to existing uh, approaches. Uh, okay, so let me uh, let me yeah. Also <laughs> so okay, just last thing uh, is that basically there is this uh, uh, strong representability theorem by Gao and Duan which shows that you can represent any physical state, so basically any output of any uh, finite depth quantum circuit, uh, with uh, a neural network with only two uh, layers. So if you add the second layer here in the Boltzmann machine, you can show that you can write exactly, and with only a polynomial number of, uh, of neurons, uh, th the output of this circuit, which is a, a pretty strong result. And in this case, you can show that the weights that you have in this network are purely local. So they correspond, if you want, to the gates that you apply at each step. And uh, at this point, we also have a construction to generate those weights for simple, um, so this is a forthcoming work, where we have a, a procedure to generate, if you want, the weights in this network for some models like the ISIM model or the, or the, or the ISIMF model. So we have, a, if you want, this is a, an alternative to the standard Patindega representation, which can be done in the space of, uh, of artificial neural networks, uh, of two-layer artificial neural networks. 
the, the important point is that only two layers are enough to describe all quantum mechanics, basically, which is non-trivial. <laughs> okay, so uh, I finish here, and uh, um, if, if you have uh, more questions, I will be happy to, to answer to them uh, later. Thank you. So if you uh, had, if two layers is good enough, <laughs> is, there any, is there any advantage to going deeper? Okay, so, so the, the tricky part is that two layers is in the, in the, it's a Boltzmann factor for two layers. So it's not a function of a function like I wrote before, unfortunately. So the tricky, the tricky thing, if you want, I mean, uh, the, the thing that at the end matters is that uh, you cannot compute exactly this, uh, this amplitude because it would inv involve tracing out the second layer, which you cannot do analytically anymore. So only if you have one layer, you can do that analytically. If you have a second layer, you cannot do that uh, anymore analytically, and you have to do some approximations or to find ways to compress the second layer back to the, to the, to the shallow layer. So that's the important part. Yeah. In uh, dynamical system literature, when mm -hmm. you iterate it function, iterate it function, so on, at the end, there emerges some kind of universality, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not doesn't matter the precise form of the function simply because you apply many, many, many times. It's the same also here. I mean, matter a lot uh, if you choose uh, one function. There. No, in, pr in practice, numerically, we've seen that okay, you can use this log of cosh, which is a function like that, but you can also use uh, use other functions, uh, basically. Uh, people typically use function which is zero. Um, and then it goes like that, and this w gives, they all give the same results, basically, at the end. They, don't. they give the same results. So the important thing is that you have some nonlinearity. <coughs> so that's the only thing is that you have some nonlinearity, and that, uh, that's the only really d the thing that matters. Then the, the, the specific form of the function is not so important, but I have to say that if you want to use complex valued variables, it becomes trickier, because you have to make sure that you are dealing with uh, some uh, typically with some analytical activation function, at least for the way we optimize the parameters. So typically, this choice is, uh, is what we use. I mean, just an addendum, but this is, uh, how to say, experimental result, or there are some theory behind it which ensure you that something's going on? No, th there is no theorem about uh, the, the, the specific activation function and why they should give you the same result, no. Apart from uh, the, the, the generic thing that tells you that if m is large enough and you have uh, a genetic activation function which is just a bounded function, so okay, so the theorem is the following. If you have a genetic activation function which is bounded between 0 and 1 but uh, monotonously increasing, then if m is large enough you can describe an arbitrary function. So this is the theorem. But in the quantum context, uh, I don't know, this pr can be probably refined, but uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, it seems like in some 2D cases your, your method gives better results than other existing wave functions that people constructed using other techniques. Yeah, so it gives a comparable or slightly better than depends on your uh, taste or how you, yeah. But what I wanted to ask is that, okay, for other methods... Uh, in this case it's sensibly better because... Okay. For other methods, uh, I know that even computing like expectation values of certain operators in 2D case becomes problematic because it's hard to contract you know, objects and indices. For your method, uh, you know, for your wave variational wave functions to compute <coughs> this energy estimator, is it... Uh, to, how to how large volumes can you go? So let's say uh, in, the, in the PEPS case you were mentioning, uh, it's problematic to contract the, the state to find the amplitude, right? Uh, in our case, what's uh, MP-hard or MP-complete is optimizing the parameters. So this optimization that we, are, we have to do is a, is a computationally hard part, which, uh, and we can easily, we, not easily, but if we are not careful, we can get stuck in some local minimum and we, we don't find the ground state. But uh, for us, computing the amplitude of the wave function or the variational state is, is very easy. So it's, uh, it's polynomial. But can you recycle information to go to higher and higher light lattices? Of Yes, so you, you, we are experimenting also with that, so basically that you train the thing on a sm small system and then you increase little by little the, the lattice. And if you do this, you, you recover a form of locality also in the weights, typically, not always. I mean, if you have a gap system, you do.